Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us at Genius Machines 2020 Virtual Summit. I'm Patrick Tucker, Technology Editor at Defense One, and it is my pleasure to kick off the next session, the role of AI and emerging technologies in joint domain operations. Today, we will take a comprehensive look at how artificial intelligence and other emerging technologies can help confront our adversaries at every domain on tomorrow's battlefield. We'll also look at how new uses of artificial intelligence, big data, and sensors can help give commanders a keen insight into the health and welfare of their troops and also the future of the technology workforce that would be at those front lines. Joining me today is Dr. Eli Nywood, Vice President for Intelligence Programs and Cross-Cutting Capabilities at NUTRA, Lieutenant General Jeff Schneider, U.S. Air Force Reserve Program Manager at the Defense Innovation Unit, and Brigadier General David Kumashiro, Director of Research and Analysis at the National Security Commission on Artificial Intelligence, uh, retired Brigadier General David Kumashiro. So thank you all for joining me today. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, let's uh, take a moment and go down the line, starting with you, Eli, uh, and just a quick two-sentence introduction to who you are and what you do. Sure. I'm Ellie Nywood. I'm the Vice President of MITRE of Intelligence and Cross-Cutting Capabilities, so I own our work for the intelligence community, as well as work where we're trying to bring together capabilities across the Department of Defense and intelligence communities that no one sponsor uh, can take on on their own. Thanks. Yes. Uh, Jeff. Yeah, hi, I'm Lieutenant Colonel Jeff Schneider, as you said, Air Force Reservist. I'm uh, working for D the Defense Innovation Unit, the program manager for the RATE initiative, which is using bio uh, wearables to detect COVID-19 and other illnesses. Okay, David. Hey, thanks, Patrick. Uh, I am currently uh, the staff lead for our line of effort two on the National Security Commission on Artificial Intelligence uh, with a focus on application of AI in national security missions. Thanks, yes. Uh, so uh, as Jeff pointed out, just a quick correction, he's a reservist, Air, U.S. Air Force Reserve, uh, but also full-time program manager at Defense Innovation Unit. Uh, so uh, let's start with you, Jeff, actually, if we can, uh, because in talking about joint all-domain operations over the last couple of years, uh, the conversation so quickly turns to uh, very highfalutin concepts of uh, advanced network architectures and whether or not uh, they're all going to work. And uh, there's a lot of conversation about jets and tanks and boats, and certainly a lot about satellites and making them all operate together. But a big part of understanding uh, what tools are going to be part of the battlefield of the future and helping commanders to really get a, a genuine sense of what that battlefield looks like, what they have at their disposal, uh, and what they're going into uh, that, that engagement with, uh, a big part of that is an understanding of uh, the force and the people that are in the force, whether they're operators or at the front lines or operators that are working behind them. Uh, and you have a really unique program that we wrote about at Defense One, got a lot of uh, traction. A lot of people were very interested in, in reading about it. I, I, for one, was very interested in hearing about it. Uh, tell us a little bit about your program. Yeah, thanks, uh, Patrick. So um, the RATE initiative is, rap is the uh, Rapid Analysis of Threat Exposure, and it's basically a byproduct of a, of a venture from a couple of years ago between us, the Defense Threat Reduction Agency, DITRA, and Philips, uh, you know, civilian global healthcare company. And uh, in a nutshell, what we were trying to do a couple of years ago was to parse down a lot of data to see if we could uh, detect that someone was sick before they knew they were gonna get sick. Had a lot of applications before that. When COVID struck, we repurposed that to see if we could use this data to not just get after COVID-19, you know, in an area that's 48 hours before someone shows symptoms, um, but get at COVID-19. So uh, what we're using in essence is a, is a watch and a ring here that are um, detecting uh, COVID-19 um, like biometric data points here throughout the day to give us a score of one to 100. So what it does is on the individual level, it's allowing us to, um, you know, monitor our own, our own readiness, but also there's an element of it that's monitored at a command level where they basically get to see a de-identified dashboard that shows all the people that are in their cohort and how they're doing on an, an infection level, right? So 
it's, it's purposed to go against things outside of COVID-19, um, but we're pushing really hard using a, a very deep AI ML program to crunch through a lot of data set to make this work for COVID-19. So you're talking about, you know, uh, military commanders having, you know, battle space awareness for their people. Um, we've clearly shown that the medical readiness of our military personnel is, 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 is a very key metric the commanders are interested in. Um, multiple instances, you know, where, where something's happened in the news and that's come up. And so um, this is really paving the way for not just COVID-19, but the future, a way to monitor in almost real time how your military uh, personnel are doing from a health perspective. And, and we're only able to do that through, again, our successful partnerships that we've had on the civilian sector and, and really be using the AI ML aspect um, for what it was, in my opinion, intended to do, a very uh, specific approach to use this. Yeah, so I, I love this story uh, in part because I, I wrote a, a book in my previous life about predictive analytics uh, back in, in 2013 when I was doing most of my writing. Uh, and I you know, was looking at the trends that were available at the time and I, I wrote about how hey, it's possible with, uh, with big data to get a sense of uh, pre-symptomatic indicators of health. And you can actually, depending on how much data you're collecting and what sort of data you're collecting, you can see uh, who's most likely to give you a, a cold, depending on who you were interacting with uh, during a day and whether or not uh, their data is part of a database that's uh, available to be regressed. And people were like, that's an insane idea. And here you are, you've actually there's a, an algorithm now that works with a, two consumer off-the-shelf wearables that will tell you, uh, give you a score uh, of your likelihood of, of getting sick within the next 48 hours before you're experiencing the symptoms of sickness. So it, it all worked out. I mean, it, it, all of the uh, ideas about uh, predictive analytics applied to human health are beginning to take root because of this. Uh, so I, I, it's a really awesome beat and I, I enjoy talking about it, but I think that it's also really important for this discussion because um, you know, the, I can't count the number of times I go into an engagement and uh, military commanders will say, hey, listen, we really have to start thinking of um, every soldier on the battlefield as a sensor. Uh, and so now you, uh, one of the things that's, one aspect of that is that these sensors are reporting data that even the wearer of these devices uh, you know, are, doesn't necessarily have any input into it. Like these, uh, the commander has a holistic sense of the health of his unit uh, or, the force under his command uh, at any time, and uh, that's sensed data. Um, and it's important because when we talk about the future of joint all domain uh, operations, we're talking about lots and lots of data that's like that, except uh, about the health of perhaps equipment uh, from predictive maintenance algorithms, predictive maintenance programs, which are also uh, very popular right now and, and uh, which the services are all putting more and more resources into. Uh, it could be uh, the health of communications links, of new uh, mesh networks that are created on the fly. And all of that data has to be synthesized and turned into something that a commander can use. And uh, it has to happen across the services and across the domains. And so uh, as these new opportunities grow for commanders to take these streams of data and know uh, the number of soldiers in their unit that might be out over the next 48 hours, so does that challenge of fusing that into something that's operationally useful. So that's a very long, uh, but I think hopefully helpful segue uh, to my question for you, David. Um, before your uh, current gig at the National Security Commission on Artificial Intelligence, uh, you were involved in the Air Force effort uh, to help them stand up their joint all domain program, uh, ABMS, it's kind of the program that's leading uh, joint all domain up like experimentation for the broader Pentagon. Uh, there was army participation, the army's moving out with its own version of a, of a joint all domain program, but the Air Force was the first. So the question is when you look at that challenge of taking all of these different streams uh, that are gonna be available to commanders and fusing them into something that's actually useful for a uh, uh, perhaps a very gifted and strategically trained human mind, but a regular human mind, what's the biggest challenge there, fusing all of these different inputs and turning them into something that a commander can use? Um, well, in, in, in many ways, I mean, to, to go back to the point, um, it is about achieving decision advantage. 
It is about dec uh, achieving decision advantage on, on the battlefield and really to enable that ability for machine teaming at machine speed in the environment uh, that we're going we're gonna to be dealing with. I think really the big challenge is that um, there's an almost an aspect of, of paralysis uh, where uh, there's, there's a piece where everyone thinks there's like you have to boil the ocean to actually get there. And I think one of the, the, the best parts about uh, my experience with the advanced battle management system and the team uh, led by Preston Dunlap on the Air Force side and very much in partnership with our sister services uh, was developing an approach that was very agile to try to not get at necessarily experimentation, but to get at it from a very agile uh, approach that integrated the warfighter alongside the technologist. Again, to incrementally move uh, to achieve all of those different uh, aspects of, of the larger enterprise uh, that enables that decision advantage. Everything from uh, connectivity to secure processing to app development and, and software factories uh, to that ability to integrate with different uh, sensors and with different uh, platforms that deliver effects, all underscored by obviously an open architecture uh, environment, um, you know, with standards, hopefully commercially available standards uh, to allow that level of, of interoperability. So I think to your point about your question about the challenge, the challenge is recognizing that we have the ability to really get at this problem set, uh, but we have to start uh, moving towards it, uh, towards it now. I think with ABMS too, I think one of the advantages is uh, it is COCOM led. So you are, we are bringing the warfighter, the Air Force is bringing the warfighter uh, front and center to the solution set uh, alongside the technology, not just from within the military, but obviously uh, from our um, industry partners. Okay, I, I want to get to to Eli, who has a great sort of contrarian take on uh, some of the things that the military is doing and uh, an important point of view. But uh, first, I want I want to stick with this idea for a second. Uh, in everything you just described, uh, both you and Jeff, uh, what role can artificial intelligence play in uh, fusing some of that uh, large volume of data uh, in order to be of maximal ad advantage and help to the decision maker? Um, where does the boundary lie between uh, a decision aid that's outputting uh, recommendations that are going to be uh, incredibly helpful uh, versus uh, a decision aid that's perhaps a little bit too conservative in the recommendations or providing too wide a spectrum of probability or something that's less useful. In your, uh, Jeff, in your encounters in Silicon Valley with AI companies that are uh, trying to work towards helping to create decision aids, uh, where do you see the best in practice? Uh, and, and David, uh, same with you. When you look at these things from the perspective of a commander, what do you need a decision aid to actually do for you? Uh, and is that what you're seeing emerging? That's a great question, Patrick. I kind of use the mantra garbage in, garbage out, right? And so if you're feeding AI a bunch of garbage, it's just going to spit out a bunch of garbage in the end. And so it's a very focused approach. You're, it's a man in the loop, the whole uh, set of ways there. So you can't just um, define a very open-ended nebulous um, type metric that, that you're going to give commanders like they, they, it should be a very specific approach so like for us we're using a, a very specific data set that's based off of you know years and years of research and we're compiling it down and we kind of have a little bit of an end goal in mind too right so we kind of know what it should look like on the end state um, we also allow the man in the loop multiple times to iterate this thing right and so I don't think from a, a programmatic standpoint that you can just sprinkle the AI, you know, ML dust on something and say, make it better, right? So it, it's the idea that somehow AI and ML can do things that, that men cannot, you know, men and women cannot in their own capacity ever do, I think is, is out. If we had a million people for a million years, we could do what AI and ML could. We just cannot do it at the speed that AI and ML can. So you start from that standpoint that we're not doing something that, humans can't already do. We're just doing it a lot faster, right? And so it should be the same approach that you would take to doing anything um, that you would prior to this. It's just allowing it to go more rapid. So it has to be a man in loop, driving it, very focused approach, 
um, and then allow iterations to take place alongside it the whole entire time. And that's what we've seen both with the rate program. It's a, it's a very intensive process. And, and we've seen that in Silicon Valley here too, uh, as far as being able to use AI and ML in a very successful target approach. Okay. Yeah, and on, on that point, um, again, it is about this synchronization between the warfighter and the technologist. It is that DevSecOps um, approach uh, taken not just from a software perspective, but elevated up uh, all the way to, to the strategic level. Um, it's really in, in large part the basis for one of the commission's recommendations uh, in terms of uh, empowering both the intelligence community and DOD's chief technology officers uh, and have the um, Undersecretary of Defense for Research Engineering uh, as the co-chair for the Joint Requirements Oversight Council. So again, it's that pairing of the warfighter with the technologist. The key piece about that though, and again, to the point about not trying to boil the ocean, the critical piece is having that warfighter perspective, that operational use case, that operational vignette that then enables the technologist industry and the warfighter to come together for these, uh, for these solutions. Okay. Uh, so, and I, I wanna turn back to some of the council's recommendations. We just had a new set out yesterday, uh, including a, a, an important recommendation about the creation of a new technology council chaired by the, the vice president, which uh, I think would be, uh, I think a lot of people are, are saying certainly overdue, um, really tackles and, and, and gives uh, homage to the significance of emerging technology as something that deserves a national strategy and a national approach. I want to get to that, but first I want to stick with uh, what we we're just talking about, joint all domain command and control, because uh, you've outlined some of the great uh, emerging aspects of AI that can that can help with that, and you, you've shown that you know there's a way to take a practical approach to artificial intelligence uh, that allows it to be useful uh, at a commander level, uh, so that the stuff that goes into a output is understandable to everyone involved, and also the importance of uh, iterative approach, um, having people at the front lines that can work with and 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 uh, make this stuff and and. Uh, retool it as circumstances demand. Uh, but one of the things that struck me in writing about JADC2 over the last couple of years is that uh, there's lots of folks across the services that are uh, very optimistic about doing something very, very hard that's never actually been done. Like this level of uh, computer and data integration uh, has never been done even within uh, the private sector. Uh, and we're talking about companies that do amazing things with logistics like Amazon and IBM. Uh, even they, with their computing resources, which are exponentially larger than those that are uh, available to the Defense Department, haven't succeeded in the sort of computer and data integration that JADC2 is really striking at. Um, all of these platforms weren't designed necessarily to be integrated. They are computers, and so they can be changed. but. Uh, it's a big change from where they are today. Uh, and so that brings me to you, Eli. In, in, as you look at the current state of the military's effort to achieve the JADC2 vision with you know, the caveat that it's kind of a 10-year vision, but it is something that they're uh, very focused on today. What's the first thing that strikes you? Uh, and where do you see some indicators that uh, observers should be cautious in their optimism? Yes, I'd say, I mean, I think there's a, there's a huge amount of energy around JADC2, and, and I think for good reason. We need the kind of capability that people are talking about there, but I, I don't think we're making the progress against it that we should be, or, you know, given the, the energy that's gone into it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, again, I, I think it's incredibly important. I think there is some good work going on, but I, I don't see us on a track to achieve what we need to in the, in the kind of timelines that our, our war fighters need. I think there's a couple of things that that are that hold us up. I, I think there's a set of myths almost around JADC2. You know, this idea that you know uh, we'll do DevSecOps and we'll have a data lake and we'll we'll bring some AI to bear and all of a sudden something magic will will pop out the other end. And you know, I think as Jeff alluded to, it, it doesn't work that way uh, in, in the in the real world. I think you know you touched on the interoperability. You know, people would like to build universal command and control languages that, you know, everything will all talk exactly the same language and you can interoperate, you know, in great, uh, you know, great, in, you know, coupling. You know, we don't think that's going to work given all the systems that are out there. You know, we've been looking at things, what we call loose couplers, just get the 
write information you know across and between systems and and interoperate in, in a very different way um, you know so I, I think those are you know things you don't want to actually send all the data to everyone and you can't I mean, it's impossible to do that. Most people, the data is not relevant to what they're trying to decide and they wouldn't know what to do with it. I, I think we sometimes lose focus and, you know, JADC2 becomes everything for everyone. Uh, you know, there are important problems to be solved in logistics and readiness and all of these areas. But I think if we start from, you know, the challenges to bring the Air Force and the Army and the Navy and all their capabilities together, you know, against some very specific problems, say it's the A2AD problem. And, uh, you know, sort of disintegrating that bubble, I, I think we could make more progress. And last, I think, I, I think we do need to bring the services together more. I mean, David's right. I mean, I think some of the ABMS demos have shown, you know, different services coming together. But I think too often, you know, when you ask the Army, they'll say, yes, we want the Air Force there. We are happy to have an Air Force LNO at our battalion talk. And, and when you ask the Air Force, they would say, of course, the AOC is multi-service. We have LNOs from the Army and from the Navy who sit at the AOC with us. You know, what we really need is for the services to be willing to give up, you know, some of their control um, and do that in a more multi-domain way, you know, have space capabilities, willing to give up some of their control of those capabilities to really contribute to the terrestrial fight and vice versa. And I think until people really own up to that and face up to that, I don't think we'll make the progress that we need. So do you feel like there's still a bit of turf protection uh, on the part of the services in, in going into this? And what are those um, areas that are the toughest for different service components to, to give up? I was talking to the Army the other day and they said, oh, we're creating a, uh, a standardized data language that's going to be the standard across all of the services. And uh, I'm not sure that that was the Air Force's understanding of the current state of data standardization language that it had been relegated to the U.S. Army. Uh, so where are there turf battles that, um, or perhaps frictions that need to be addressed before there can be real progress? Yeah, and so I think, you know, that look, there has been, I think, great progress in the services coming together. I think there's much more openness than there was before. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think there are certainly, you know, again, I think the ABMS demos are one where many services have come to play and the combatant commanders have each pushed things. At the same time, I think when you talk about, you know, sort of uh, the, the peer fight in some of the combatant commands, you know, not clear to me that the service components have really, you know, seen what they need to do to come together. And I don't think it's so much a turf protection sometimes as it is just the complexity of the fight is so great that they, they wouldn't know how to operate and do command and control, you know, across all of the domains, across all of the services at once. I think they might be willing to, they just don't have the tools to do that. I think we can help there. I think when it comes to the acquisition side, there, you know, there's still challenges. How do you get, you know, and develop as you, as you point out, you know, interfaces or APIs that all of the services can use. I think that's an approach we can take, but it will require, you know, giving up some control over your own problems, your own services. You know, again, will an army unit in the field be willing to use their, you know, long range weapons, uh, you know, to support an Air Force mission? You know, when the fight is going on and, you know, people are calling for fire, it, it takes a lot to be willing to say, I'm going to give up some of that control knowing that in the long run, I'll be better off for it. I think we need to show them the benefits they might accrue and, and be able to convince them through demos, through project convergence, through ABMS on-ramps, through other kinds of experiments, that it really will pay off for them in the long run. And, that, and then I think they'll come along pretty quickly. And Patrick, if I could just quickly inject, I mean, part of this also is uh, not just about um, the, the iterative process for technology. This is really about the speed and the agility of all of those other pieces of the operational concepts of the training of the organizations of the personnel to be able to adapt to this new environment. And I think part of you had um, asked the question earlier about the, the challenges. Again, I go back to some of the institutional challenges, whether it's in acquisition or resourcing. Again, one of the recommendations that the commission uh, put out this quarter was the need for uh, transition funding that allowed some of these emerging technologies 
uh, to make it from um, an s and or an R&D uh, stage to uh, actually get it in the hands of the warfighters and, and scale, to that, uh, scale to that level. So uh, again, to, um, to Ellie's point, I think there, there are a lot of uh, uh, institutional uh, challenges that we have to uh, get through. But again, getting the right people um, uh, out there, the right technologist, uh, kind of changing that workforce, um, I think is really, really important. I think if I could further on that too. Yeah, go ahead, please. Yeah, so I mean, that's one of our, our bread and butter, you know, um, uh, thumbs up, pat ourselves on the back um, advancements we've done at DIU, right? So we're a joint multi-service organization. And I think we've been a very successful, especially in the AI ML uh, area. Um, for one, we have an AI ML portfolio, so we spend a lot of time there, but uh, we, we go out to, to truly find the best and the brightest on the civilian sector, but also integrate in, in the joint service. And we'll do prototyping at a very early age. Our contract vehicle allows that to happen and allows us to iterate, stumble a little bit, get some lessons learned, continue to iterate and prototype it very quickly and to, to bridge with the Silicon Valley, the other you know, um, companies out there to make a difference at that. So we're joint by nature already. So that helps with a lot of the interoperability. We have the right talent pool here and we have you know, the right contract vehicles to allow us to go very quickly. It doesn't work for everything, mm -hmm. um, right? But we've been very successful for our targeted approach to, to try to make a difference in, in specifically the AI ML uh, arena. So I think that works there, um, obviously, we're not a program of record, um, so we can only take it so far. So we'll take it through prototype, and then you know we hopefully bake this pie up good, and we hand it off to the services to then do. Um, but when you're talking about trying to start off within a single service to take on something that's going to be joint in nature, I think you're going to have issues that just are going to be, you know, germane to the organization you started with here. Um, so that that's one approach just to consider is start off from a joint entity, whether it's DIU. Um, or another joint entity, start off with the, the joint entity first since they are working at a multi-service level and then move it along the prototype to roll it out um, from a joint perspective. Right, well, let me stick with that personnel issue because uh, you have a great window into uh, some of the best computer talent that exists on the planet right now out in Silicon Valley. And one of the things that strikes me when talking to different people in different services about the JADC2 vision is how uh, actually very people reliant it is uh, and how it envisions kind of a, a changing role for service members. You know, we're very used to talking about service members uh, in that sort of, I don't know, Tom Clancy-esque vision where they've got the scope on and there's lots of, you know, stuff for the, for the knees and the elbows and, you know, they're uh, kicking down the door, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but just watching uh, the Project Convergence demo out in Yuma, uh, there was a lot of emphasis on, yeah, very much like real time at the spear tip coding. Uh, and that's a transformation in our uh, traditional idea of what it means to be involved in uh, combat operations. This is sort of like, you know, coding at the point of combat in a way. Um, or very, very close to it. So I wonder if we could talk uh, very briefly, Jeff, first your window into um, whether or not the Defense Department is really taking advantage of uh, the talents and skills of service people at that lower level to move them uh, into those roles as, uh, as quickly as possible. And uh, also among the broader computer literate coding community, uh, enthusiasm that you see for working with the Department of Defense. Uh, is it changing? Is it growing? Uh, is it there? Uh, and I would turn the, the same question to you, David. Uh, when you look at the Defense Department right now, you hear a lot from, uh, you know, three stars and four stars that say, absolutely, we want to encourage and support our smartest, youngest uh, service members with IT skills. And then so often with the Defense Department, there's that middle layer that just exists there that no one can see, but somehow no one can get around that somehow prevents them from getting into those roles that uh, uh, even people at the very top of command are very eager for them to get into. So do those barriers exist right now and how quickly can we get rid of them? But first you, Jeff, a little yeah, bit about what pretty, you're saying. Great questions. Um, you know, I'll talk from the DIU perspective. I think to your first point, you know, the answer is uh, yes. We, we, I mean, truly DIU empowers every single individual that works. Um, I mean, we do a, a very in-depth vetting process. So I think that's where we're able to develop that trust at a very early um, state. 
I can say, and I'm sure that David could talk through his military career, but generally when you go to a new organization, there's a little bit of a, you're the new guy, you know, um, go over here in color for a little while. Um, and, and it takes about six months or so until now you're allowed to voice kind of your ideas out there. DIU is the opposite. Um, you know, there's, a, there's an extensive vetting process, but day one that you're there, it's more or less like 3M. What, what ideas do you have? How can we make this thing better? And then if you have a good idea, we'll elevate it up, um, you know, proceed with funding if necessary and start prototyping it. So we encourage every single person and we empower them to, to get after things. And so there's a very much um, a lot of excitement and enthusiasm over a lot of different projects we have there. So I'm seeing that, you know, from our perspective and then also the different agencies that we're working with honestly, like the enthusiasm we bring, like the empowerment, since we're a joint DOD level organization, we have different contract vehicles that allow us to go very, very fast to prototype something. So we can work in, in weeks to months, whereas other organizations may take years just to get the FAR process there. So we're cutting through red tape. And people, I think, are generally excited to work for us and work with us. From the civilian aspect, um, I'm, I'm not seeing any slowdown in enthusiasm, to be honest. Um, you know, it, it's difficult under COVID-19, so we can't have these face-to-face -face interactions that we normally would have yeah. with, the, with the Silicon Valley companies there. But, uh, you know, we're, we're very good at teleworking with DIU. We're very good at doing remote engagement. So we're still very much engaged with all the different uh, companies um, that are on our SBIR lists, and, and, and they're very enthusiastically engaged to work with us. So I, I'm, I'm not seeing any slowdown. Okay. Yeah, on, on my end, um, I'll first start with the, um, with the NSCAI recommendation, one of them which has gained incredible traction, not just with the Hill, but with, uh, with academia and with industry, is this concept of a U.S. Digital Service Academy on par with West Point Annapolis or the Air Force Academy. Uh, and the point being um, is this, uh, this need, uh, this demand signal, this imperative for technical skill across the federal workforce. Uh, and so, again, recognizing the need for STEM, as we look at artificial intelligence, you need that workforce. Uh, and you need that workforce, not just at a very um, junior level, but also you need the training and development, uh, development at all echelons so that senior leaders have a greater appreciation and better fluency uh, and understand the vernacular of technology to, to ask the right, the right questions. I think we'll also find, too, um, where I think um, uh, some of our junior ranks are actually much more adept in this environment is, is again, just by their uh, exposure to technology. Uh, and when you look perhaps at a future state of warfare, uh, looking through uh, VR glasses, virtual reality type glasses, um, do you trust your four star to be able to manage that type of environment uh, in, a, in a manner that they have not been exposed to when compared to some of our more, uh, more, more junior uh, war fighters. The other thing too that I would think I would say is that from an industry perspective, and I've heard, heard uh, this from our commissioners, is um, when you look at uh, the process of developing uh, this technology and the software, again, these, these product line managers are a much different approach than program management from a traditional acquisition um, uh, process. And so those product line managers uh, that have that technical skill who are coming out of colleges, I think that's where we're going to find um, a lot of value. And again, the Digital Service Academy um, hopefully gets some, some really good traction uh, this round in, in Congress. And uh, we see that to uh, fruition in the not so distant future. Yeah, I, I, before I go to uh, Eli for final thoughts and recommendations for actually achieving all of the things that the Pentagon says that they want to achieve with JADC2. Uh, uh, let me take just a quick moment and ask you about the most recent uh, recommendations from the, uh, from the council that came out yesterday. Uh, creation of a technology council chaired by the vice president tasked with the development of a new national technology strategy. Um, what uh, have we up until now uh, taken emerging technologies seriously enough? Is this something that uh, needs to be part of a daily West Wing discussion. Is that kind of the recommendation? David? Um, yeah, so um, from our commissioner's perspectives, the, the importance of um, having that top-down leadership involvement is incredibly important, whether it be from uh, the president or whether it be from the secretary of defense. 
Um, that is why some of the or some of the earlier recommendations from the uh, commission really focused on a tri chair. Uh, for emerging technologies, which included the Deputy Secretary of Defense, the Vice Chairman, and the Principal Deputy for, uh, for DNI. It is uh, why, again, this focus on uh, the Jake Director being a direct report to the Secretary of Defense or the Deputy Secretary of Defense. The purpose being within a bureaucracy, within a hierarchical structure like DOD, you need that top-down driven leadership, uh, both from an authority's perspective and also to gain uh, the resourcing and the traction if, uh, you know, to really elevate AI as the priority within the Department of Defense. Okay, well, I, I, I hope it passes because then I would have more to write about than tanks and boats and ships. Uh, but Eli, final thoughts, because you've highlighted the uh, tremendous challenges to actually realizing this, uh, this vision. Uh, very briefly, three things that could happen now that would put the Pentagon in a better position to achieve its ambitions in this regard. Yeah, so I would say, I think first is I would flip things around and you know not talk about sort of elevating AI or elevating emerging tech, but let's outline what is the mission problem. I think, you know, David talked about this before, you know, what is the, what are the, what is the challenge we need to address? And then what's the best technology for addressing that challenge? Let's have the discussion that way. If it's AI, great. If it's, you know, simple automation, great. I think that's what, you know, I think that will help us. I think the same thing is true from the people perspective. I don't think we're getting the best from Silicon Valley when it comes to JADC2 because we haven't given them a concrete challenge to solve. I mean, again, I think when Jeff talked about the wearables, very specific what they were looking for and very specific what they needed an algorithm for. I think that, I think that made a huge difference. And then I do think somehow we need to be able to get at it from a joint perspective. There needs to be leadership, you know, from a combatant command or from a joint organization. Doesn't mean that the Air Force won't do part of the acquisition, the, the Army won't do part of the acquisition. But I think we need more of that leadership that's really looking at that joint problem. I think that would help us. Those would be my three things. Yes, there's the leadership thing again. So uh, very important that we uh, continue to put some pressure on, on leadership uh, to actually uh, put in place the sort of pressure, the sort of commitment, the sort of attention that uh, they seem very interested in, in applying to this problem. But you know, it's a, it's a daily struggle. So uh, I'll be there. I want to uh, thank all of you for being part of this panel today. Unfortunately, we're out of time. Uh, I want to thank you also for joining us. Uh, be sure to stay tuned for the rest of today's sessions. Uh, and thanks so much.